Hi, I'm Ben with Filthy Motorsports and Crawlpedia.com. In this video, I'll be going over reservoirs and whether you need them on your shocks or not. So this is a very typical question that I get. Um, a lot of times I'll see an order come through online where I'll notice the customer has left them off of their build sheet. So I'll follow up with them and I'll find that it's normally done for one of two reasons. Either they're trying to save a little bit of money on their order or they think they have an application where they don't need the additional cooling capacity of a reservoir. And that brings us to the first big misconception about reservoirs. A lot of people think that they're there strictly for cooling. And yes, while they'll do a little bit of that, that's not really what they're there for. As a shock cycles, the shaft moves into the cylinder. As it moves into the cylinder, it takes up space, and that space that it takes up, that, that oil needs to go somewhere. Um, similarly, if the shock heats up, or as the shock heats up, the oil will expand a bit, and again, needs somewhere to go. In an emulsion shock like this without a reservoir, that means we have to put less oil inside of that cylinder. So that way, as the shock fully compresses, it doesn't hydrolock. Another issue with an emulsion shock is that there's nothing separating the nitrogen pressure from the oil. So inside of this cylinder, instead of having 100% pure oil, we have an oil-nitrogen mixture. So that's like having bubbles in your power steering system. It'll still work, you'll still be able to steer, but it's going to be mushy and not as controlled or firm as you want it to be. And the same thing applies for shocks. And when you're spending big money on a set of high-end shocks like these Kings, that's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot because the whole purpose of the shock is to control the vehicle and to be able to tune it to control the vehicle. Well, when it's mushy like that, you won't be able to do it fully. Now, there are applications where an emulsion shock will work just fine. So if you're building a um, a daily driving Jeep, something that really doesn't go off-road all that much, but you want um, a decent set of shocks that you won't have to rebuild or buy new ones every couple of years, um, and you don't need that full firm valving through and through and you're not going to be uh, tuning it to the, the, the tiniest degree, an emulsion shock might make sense. However, since we typically deal with high-performance applications, for those, you always, always have to have a reservoir. With a reservoir, um, as the shaft moves into the shock cylinder, it takes up space and moves that oil into the reservoir. Inside the reservoir, you'll see an internal floating piston that separates the nitrogen pressure from the oil. Uh, you'll also notice the position of that. The oil really only takes up a small space in that reservoir. So the second biggest mis misconception about reservoirs is that they're completely full of oil, and that's not the case. Uh, in fact, it's mostly nitrogen. Of course, as the shock cycles and as it heats up, this might move up a bit, move up and down, um, but again, mostly nitrogen. So it'll do some cooling, but not as much as people think. So separating the nitrogen from the oil also has a, another uh, important effect it lets us do some additional tuning with the shock. So without going into it in full detail, uh, briefly, the more pressure you have in the reservoir, the more it forces the shims on the piston to go through the oil. Um, the less pressure you have in there, the first thing that happens is it'll help it'll start to compress that nitrogen before the valving happens inside of that shock. So Let's take two examples. If we've got a mud drag racer that basically lines, uh, that moves up to the starting line cold, does a blast, and doesn't give a chance the shocks to heat up, well, as the shock heats up, it compresses the nitrogen, and it, on its own, increases that pressure. Since it doesn't have a chance to heat up, we have to artificially increase the pressure in that reservoir, 200, 250 PSI, to let that valving happen instantaneously. If you're building a rock crawler or a, a daily driver weekend wheeler Jeep, we can reduce that pressure, let some of that shaft movement move the and compress the nitrogen a bit before it gets into its full valving. And of course, the nice thing about that is it's very easy to adjust, very easy to change. Um, also, when a lot of people ask us, what's the proper pressure for a reservoir? The answer is 150 PSI to start uh, and then move from there. You can bring it down a bit, you can move it up a bit. Uh, that's part of the tuning process. 
So hopefully that helps explain and answer some of the questions that you had about reservoirs. Of course, if you've got any additional questions or if there's something that I've missed during this review, please feel free to email me at sales at filthymotorsports.com or info at crawlpedia.com. Also feel free to leave a comment under this video. Uh, we will be checking those uh, as often as we can. Again, my name is Ben with Filthy Motorsports and Crawlpedia. Thanks again for watching.